All right, title of my sermon today is Once Saved, Always Saved. Once Saved, Always Saved. I wanted to remind us of this beautiful truth in the Bible, a truth where when you realize what it means to be once saved, always saved, it makes you just fall down on your face and um, just exalt the love of God towards you. And uh, we'll look at a couple of verses today on why I believe once saved, always saved. But really, once saved, always saved really exalts the love of God. Why does it? Because the more you learn about yourself, the more you reflect on your own spiritual failures and your own spiritual life, you'll realize that, you know, man, the more I sin, the more I am undeserving of God's love and yet God loves me anyway. You know, God, you know, dying on the cross for us, knowing our past, present, and future, and even though He knew everything that you were going to do in your life, every sin that you were going to commit, every sin that you will commit, and yet He willingly went to the cross. God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what does it mean to be once saved, always saved? I mean, this doctrine is often known as eternal security, the eternal security of the believer. And that's really what it means. I mean, that's why I think it's great that it's defined, uh, you know, the position is called once saved, always saved, because that's literally what we mean by it, is that once a person is saved, they are always saved. And people will say, well, do you mean always saved? Uh, you know, what if they do this? What if they do that? What if they you know think of any scenario you can that's what we mean that once they are saved they are always saved regardless of the condition that you set after that now we're not saying that there's no such thing as a false profession now obviously there are people that say they believe and don't actually believe and who those people are we don't always know right because you can't judge a person's heart but you can judge what they say we know the people that don't believe because they tell us they don't believe we well, don't always know the people that say they believe they have a profession but they're not holding fast to the profession in the sense that they actually believe what they're professing so once saved always saved does not negate the fact that there are people out there that profess to believe on jesus christ but don't actually believe romans 10 says for the heart man believeth unto righteousness but look and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation see your mouth has to confess what you actually believe in the heart as opposed to just professing something but not actually believing it and we see that in the bible we see that in the book of hebrews we see that in the book of galatians which is why paul is saying you've fallen from grace because god has extended grace to them they made a profession of grace but Paul is starting to think, wait a second, why do you, these guys that profess grace, salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ want to be, come again under bondage? You know, do they actually believe what they are professing? And this is why he stood in doubt of them. So we're not saying that there's no such thing as a false profession. We're saying if tr somebody truly confesses with their mouth, they believe in their heart, they are saved, they have eternal life, once they are saved, they will always be saved. And this doctrine is so important because it's intertwined with salvation. I mean, obviously, if Jesus Christ died for your sins, you're saved forever. And just like there are so many verses in the Bible that people will try and use to preach work salvation, for the same token, people will use many verses in the Bible to preach that you can lose your salvation, that when you got saved, you didn't get completely saved. And... I'll go, I'm going to preach another sermon in a couple of weeks going over many of those verses just so you can guys can get an explanation um, of a lot of the objections to eternal security. But today I'm just talking about the verses that support once saved, always saved. Why we believe once saved, always saved. So we're not saying that there's no such thing as a false profession. Obviously there are people out there that say they believe or claim to be Christians that are not actually saved. The other thing is, people will say, well, once saved, always saved. You believe that you're just giving people a license to sin. Now, that's not what it means either. Once saved, always saved doesn't mean it's okay to continue sinning. What it means is even if you continue to sin, you are still saved. It doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. 
Now this phrase of having a license to sin is so silly because I mean nobody needed a license to sin before they were saved. I mean people people sin just fine without a license, right? And believers the same. They will sin just fine without giving them a license to sin. It's not that, you know, you teach certain doctrines that's going to stop people from sinning. Christians sin as well. They sin willfully too. It's not that getting saved stops you from sinning willfully. Why? Because you still have the flesh. You still have the flesh that is in you that causes you to sin willfully. But look at what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that even if you continue to sin, grace would abound. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So see, as the law is added, we realize that sin is exceedingly sinful. But look at this. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So you can't out-sin God's grace. And that's why you can never sin away your salvation. Now, does this mean we have a license to sin? Does this mean God is condoning of sin? No, because in Romans 6 it says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So you see, even if you continue in sin, grace will abound. But the Bible is saying, should you continue in sin, that grace may abound. Should we have the attitude that, well, I'm saved anyway, therefore it doesn't matter how many sins I commit? No. The Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, a believer ought not to continue in sin, ought not to have the attitude that just because I'm saved, it's fine for me to continue in sin. Of course it's not fine for you to continue in sin. God is upset and he's displeased with your sin, but are you still saved if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course, because even if we continue in sin, grace will abound. Now, what do we face as believers if we choose to continue in sin? You ought to fear the loving chastisement of your heavenly Father, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So you can see that this punishment of God, when he punishes a believer and he chastises a believer, it is not out of hatred. You know, it's just like my children. When I punish them, I don't hate them. I love them because I'm trying to correct them. It's the same with God. But do my children fear getting spanked, getting a, getting a chastisement from their father. Yes, they should. And so should we as believers and children of God. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure ch chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons now that ought to scare us in the sense that you know we ought to think hey if i am truly a child of god and i'm living in continual willful sin and i'm not being chastised that ought to make us wake up and think hey do i actually believe the right thing because if i'm a if i'm a true believer of god god says hey if we continue in sin we are going to get chastised but then if we are not chastised then are you bastards and not sons so it's something we ought to reflect on, just to make sure, hey, do I actually believe the right thing? Or am I an unbeliever just professing Jesus Christ as opposed to somebody who actually believes what I'm professing? If I'm living in sin, there should be chastisement of God coming on our lives. Now let's look at five reasons why I believe in once saved, always saved. And you know, people will say, well, if, if you tell somebody that once they're saved, they're always saved, then what reason is there to do good works? Have you ever heard people say that? Well, there, is more, there, there are more reasons to go, do good works than just whether you go to heaven or hell. And honestly, if somebody's reason for why they're doing good works is because they want to go to heaven. That is the very definition of work salvation. Work salvation is when you're doing good works for the purpose of saving yourself from hell or entering heaven. So there must be other reasons why we do good and bad besides heaven and hell. Because if heaven and hell are the reasons why we're doing good and bad, that's what work salvation is. And there are plenty of reasons why to do good and bad. You know, you love God. You want to be a blessing to your fellow brothers and sisters. You want to get people saved. You want to raise a godly family. There are plenty of reasons why to do good and bad 
as opposed to going to heaven or hell. And in fact, that reason has to be removed from the equation. Otherwise, we are believing in works salvation. So let's go through five reasons why I believe once saved, always saved. And the first reason is it's purely by definition. We read through John 3 and we saw a couple of verses there that have the word eternal life. John 3, we see here it's said two different ways, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So you see there the present tense of having eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, you know, people can quote this two ways. You know, sometimes you might have quoted whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, you say, oh, did I quote it wrong? No, because it's actually quoted two ways in the Bible, both with eternal life and everlasting life. Now, if you look up the definition of eternal and everlasting, they basically mean the same thing. Eternal means, if you look it up on, on Google, it actually says lasting forever, never ending. And then everlasting life obviously means that it's eternal, that it's forever. So it's just two ways. They're just synonymous. Eternal life and everlasting life are synonymous. They're just two different words that mean the exact same thing. And the Bible uses them interchangeably. Eternal life and everlasting life. So if we think of the first reason why we believe in everlasting life, it's just the very definition of the word. How can you say you have everlasting life if it can be lost? If you can have everlasting life today by the very definition of the word everlasting, you have it forever. It doesn't end. So if one day it ends, it's not everlasting life that you got. It's not eternal life that you got. So just from the very definition. Let's look at some other verses. It's all throughout the book of John. John 4.13 Jesus answered and said unto him, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. See, if you could lose everlasting life, that means one day you will thirst. How can Jesus say you never thirst if one day you could lose your salvation? John 5, verily, verily, what does that mean? That means truly, truly. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, present tense, everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So you see there the present tense that you have everlasting life. The future tense that you will not come into condemnation. Why? Because in the past, you have passed from death unto life. So if you were to pass back into death, then you could never have everlasting life. Now, some people think of everlasting life like something that can be had and then taken away. That's something that can be given away. But see, that's the same thing as, as dying, as losing eternal life. Because the fact that you have everlasting life, if you were ever to lose life, what is that? That's death. So you can't have life forever if at one point you die because it's eternal, it's everlasting. And really, to me, this is just, I don't know how somebody who believes you can lose your salvation can get around the clear repetitiveness of having everlasting life in the present tense. How to, this is why when, when we start looking at the other verses, which I'll go into in other sermons, you'll start to think like, Victor, why are you trying to explain these verses this way? Because this phrase of having everlasting life is so clear in the Bible. The Bible can't say you have everlasting life, that you won't come into condemnation, that you'll never perish if it can be lost. Because then you can come into condemnation. You can lose everlasting life. It wouldn't be everlasting to begin with. John 6, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we do see instances where we have everlasting life and instances where we will have everlasting life. See that he may have everlasting life and will raise him up on the last day. And this is why it's so important that you keep in mind my last sermon, right? My last sermon of the stages of spiritual life. Because yes, you have everlasting life now, spiritually, but one day you will physically have everlasting life when we're giving our new bodies. And that's why the Bible can talk about 
having everlasting life in the present and having everlasting life in the future, inheriting everlasting life because one day our salvation will be complete. Now, what is the difference in somebody who believes in work salvation and somebody who believes in grace and eternal security is they believe you can somehow have the spiritual everlasting life but lose the second everlasting life and still go to hell. Now, even if we, even if we thought about it from that way, how can you have half have everlasting life and half not have everlasting life? I mean, where does, if, you're, if you're born again, where is God going to send your soul? Is he going to send it to heaven or hell? Well, if he sends your soul to hell, then you never had everlasting life spiritually in the present. So that's why the correct way to think about it is once you start on that journey, once you believe and have spiritual everlasting life, you will have physical everlasting life. It's part of the same promise. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Present tense. John 10, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. This is one of my favorite verses. It just says, hey, it says the positive, that you will get everlasting life, and the negative, that you'll never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 11, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you believe on Jesus Christ, you will never die? If you live and believe in him, you'll never die? 1 John 5, this is the record. This is what we have to believe to be saved. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. So you see, part of, the, part of what we have to believe in order to be saved is the fact that we are saved forever, that we have eternal life, that that's what God has given us. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. What is this life talking about? Eternal life. If you have the Son, you have the eternal life that God has given us. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Look at this. That ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now let me ask you this. Think about this. How can you know you have life forever if one day you could lose it? Some way you could lose it. I mean, you don't know your future. I mean, God knows everything you're going to do in the future, but you don't. So how do you know you're not going to do that one sin or that one act that's going to make you lose salvation if it's possible to lose salvation? There would be no way the Bible could say you can know that you have eternal life in the present if there was a way that you could lose it. You just, they couldn't say that. Because how do you know you're not going to do the thing that is going to be done? Now, like we talked about the process of, hey, once you are spiritually saved, you will obtain physical salvation. And this is why I believe Philippians 1.6 says this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of of Jesus Christ. You know, some people believe that, and this is one thing you have to be careful of when you talk about people, uh, when you talk to people and you talk about eternal security. See, when we believe once saved, always saved, we're saying that we are saved by Jesus and we are kept saved by Jesus. But you know what some people believe about eternal security? When, when they say, I'm always going to be saved, they think Jesus will not let them do that thing that will make them lose salvation, right? Whether it's some sort of sin. How can you have any assurance that way? If you say, well, Jesus is going to keep me saved because he's going to stop me from doing that one thing that's going to stop me from, getting, stop me from staying saved. Well, how come Jesus doesn't stop you from sinning at all? Do you know? So it's, it, if, you, if you think of it that way, if they think, well, you know, Jesus is not going to let me do what it's going to take to get, to get unsaved, well, Jesus doesn't stop you from sinning in the flesh, you know, it's like, so you're still sinning. And, you know, generally people that believe you can lose your salvation, they believe it's by sinning. 
You know, they always go to Hebrews 10 and say, we sin willfully. Well, if you lose your salvation by sinning willfully, Jesus hasn't stopped you from sinning willfully in the sense that you still have the flesh. In the spirit, yes, we don't sin anymore, but you still sin as the Christian. So it's not us that are keeping ourselves saved. It's Jesus that's keeping us saved. That's why he's begun the good work and he'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in Galatians, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So he's saying, are you going to keep yourself saved? No, no, you got saved by the spirit. The spirit is going to keep you saved. Because why? Because it's all the work of Jesus Christ that gets us saved. It's not of ourselves. And that's the second point. The second reason why I believe in once saved, always saved, is because salvation is not of works. Right? What do I mean by that? Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. See, we do not work our way to heaven. We don't earn our salvation. We don't keep ourselves saved. Now, the reason why I believe in eternal security, that it's not by works, because if I didn't work my way to heaven, if I didn't, if I, if I didn't work in order to earn everlasting life, how can I not do enough works to keep everlasting life? See, if I wasn't good enough to get salvation, how can I be bad enough to lose salvation? If salvation is not by works, I can't lose it through a lack of works. Right? I didn't deserve it. I can't be bad enough to lose it. See, so I don't earn my salvation. Therefore, I don't keep myself saved. Because you know what? If I wasn't good enough to earn salvation, newsflash, I'm not going to be good enough to keep salvation. Because... You know, if they're saying we have to, you know, because they don't believe, people that believe you can lose salva your salvation don't believe you can earn your salvation by works, but yet they think you can keep your salvation through works. Well, what was the standard of salvation to earn it by works? It was perfection. Why would the standard be any less to keep salvation? Right? They're using the same verses to prove that you have to earn salvation. And the Bible says, hey, if we keep the whole law yet offend in one point, we're guilty of all. So we don't earn our salvation. We don't keep ourselves saved. Jesus is who keeps us saved, who preserves us. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, look at this, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. You see, we don't preserve our own salvation. Jesus Christ preserves us. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So you see, it's Jesus that keeps us from falling. It's Jesus that presents us faultless and to, before his own presence, the Bible teaches. Now, people might say, well, you know, you don't have to uh, not, sin. you don't have to, you don't, you can't sin away your salvation. You know, there are people out there that believe, no, no, it's just if you stop believing then you'll lose salvation. You know, now it's funny about, I, I've never met, you know, because when we talk about, hey, what if I stop believing? Would I lose my salvation? Generally, we talk about in the hypothetical because I'm not sure how many people who actually believe salvation and truly understand salvation ever stop believing. And all the people that I've seen believe you can lose your salvation always end up going down into work salvation. Because when they start looking at the verses that they think teach you can lose your salvation, it's all about you know, keeping the commandments and doing good works and all that sort of stuff. So then they start really believing that keeping the faith or continuing to believe, they, they think about it like a Jehovah's Witness, like you're exercising your faith, you're actually doing works as opposed to just having faith. But even if hypothetically somebody could like let's say they they just stop believing they just stop believing that there was a god or they became an atheist or they became an agnostic they no longer believed in god or they no longer believe in jesus christ would they still be saved well what does it mean to have everlasting life what does it mean to have to be once saved always saved to have present tense eternal life it means you will always be saved 
That's why I believe salvation is a, is a, is a one-way road. It's a door you can enter like the ark, but once you go in, the Bible says God shut them in because God keeps you saved. Look at what it says here in 2 Timothy 2. I believe this is a verse that supports eternal security, even in the event of doubt. It says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. What does that mean? That means even if you stop believing, that Jesus Christ is God. Even, even if in the, in the hypothetical, you turn your back and, on God and say, you know what, I don't even believe God exists anymore. I'm an atheist. The Bible says here you would still be saved. Why? Because God can't deny himself. See, you may deny God. You may forsake God. But then God, once he's given you eternal life, if he was to take away your eternal life, he would be denying himself. Why? Because it's something now he has promised. You see, so you may promise something to your ch children and even if they don't keep their end of the bargain, God is saying here, well, I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to become a liar just because you stop believing in me because you've ha you have everlasting life. You are saved. Now, even, is it possible? I don't know. Is there, you know, it must be possible because you know, people out there can believe not. You know, why would the Bible say something like this if it's not possible? But the Bible says, hey, even if you believe not, God will not deny himself. Now, I'm not going into objections today. I'll go into objections in another sermon and I'll go, through, I'll go through all the verses that I can think of and explain to you how to understand them in light of eternal security. Number three is, now let's say somebody said, because I, I don't necessarily believe it's losing salvation through works if you don't believe. You know, you might say, well, unbelief is a sin and therefore you're sinning. Yeah, I guess so in that sense. But I don't believe it's works because I don't believe having faith on Jesus Christ is works. You know, to believe on Jesus Christ is grace. But the reason why you can't lose it is because of this verse. But also, what this verse is alluding to is my third reason, is the unchanging promise of God. Why do I believe in once saved, always saved? It's because God has promised eternal life. And if he's promised it, he's not going to break that promise. 1 John 2 says, and this is the promise of that he hath promised us. I don't know how much clearer God can get. He's like, hey, I'm promising you this promise. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Now, what makes the promise of God so unique? It's because God cannot lie. See, I can promise you something, but I can lie. I can go back on my promise. People can promise you things and go back on their promise. They can break their word. But when God promises something, he never goes back on his word. Why? Because it's impossible for him to lie. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life. Why can we trust that we have eternal life? Why can we put our hope in eternal life? Which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You see, so it was a plan that was put in place before the world began that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if God, that's why sometimes when I show people John 10, 28, and it says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, you say, well, is Jesus lying when he said that? Because if you can perish, Jesus was lying. Hebrews 6, look at what it says here. It says, for when God made promise to Abraham, so this is the promise of blessing to Abraham upon which salvation is based, right? The promise of blessing. Because he could, look, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. See, so normally when you make a promise, you make an oath, you're usually swearing by something greater. And it's saying here, well, when God made promise to Abraham, he couldn't swear by anything greater, so he just did it by himself, right? Saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, talking about Abraham, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath the confirmation is to them an end of all strife. What is that saying? It's saying when men swear by a greater authority than themselves, that kind of puts any strife to rest, right? Or whether or not they're telling the truth. Or whether they're really meaning what they're saying. But it says, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. What does immutability mean? The unchanging nature of his promise. Right? If you think about mutant, you know, they change 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, my kids are into right now. Immutability means it's, that doesn't have the ability to change, right? The immutability of his counsel, his words, right? So how do we know we're once saved, always saved? Because when God promises something, he gives counsel. The, the, the fact that he has a promise to Abraham, it's unchanging. Confirmed, not only that, he confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things. So what are the two immutable things? The immutability of his counsel and the fact that he's sworn by an oath by himself. That by two immutable things. So not only that, now there's a third factor. There are two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. So it's like you have three assurances there. One is that he's promised it. Two is that he's, he's sworn an oath to his promise. And then three is the fact that he can't even lie about his oath and his promise. It's impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation, right? A comfort, confidence, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So how do you lay hold on that hope? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what it says in Romans 11. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, oftentimes people will joke and use this verse to say, see, you don't have to repent in order to be saved. Right? The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying that the gifts and calling of God are, are without repentance on the part of the believer, right? Because the believer needs to repent of unbelief in order to believe on Jesus Christ. They need to repent of dead works and have faith toward God. So salvation always has a repentance. It's just not a, a repentance of sin, right? It's not stopping sin to believe on the Saviour, because that's work salvation. It's turning from trusting your works to believing on Jesus Christ. But what this is saying in Romans 11 is that when God gives a gift, right, the gifts and calling of God, God does not repent. Right? God doesn't lie. He's not going to change that promise, which is what Romans 11 is talking about. Hebrews 13, another promise from God. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. What is he saying? Don't desire material wealth. Don't, 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 don't chase for riches in this world. And be happy with what you have. Be content with the things that you have. Why? For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So why is he saying be content with the things that you have? And don't be covetous. Because God is enough. You ought to be content with the fact that you have the Lord Jesus Christ. And not having to get your joy and getting your fulfillment through material possessions. All right, so one reason is the plain definition of eternal life. Two is we don't work our way to heaven, so we can't lose salvation by not doing works. Number three is that God has, an, has made an unchanging promise. And even if you were to go back, you were to forsake him, you were to stop believing, God would not repent of his promise that he made to you, which is that you would have everlasting life the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the fourth reason why I believe in once saved, always saved? It's because we have full remission. What does that mean? Full remission. Remission is when you cancel a debt. Right? So we have a debt because of sin. We have a punishment to pay. And that debt was not only partially paid when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus fully paid for it when he died on the cross. When he sacrificed himself. Hebrews 10. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And look at this. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He will remember them no more, our sins and, and iniquities. Now, how do we know that he's paid for all of them in this passage? Because now where remission of these is, where remission of sin is, there is no more offering for sin. See, there's no other offering for sin. Why? Because Jesus, as an offering, paid for all sin. Full remission. Now, if there is full remission of sins, every single sin has been paid for, what possible sin could there be that you could commit in the future that is not already paid for? 
Obviously, you have to do something in order to lose salvation, but if every sin that you ever commit has been paid for, what sin are you going to commit that would make you lose salvation? No sin, because it's eternal life. Isaiah 53, surely he hath borne our griefs, he hath carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you see how Jesus, on the Lord Jesus Christ, was laid the iniquity of all men, past, present, and future. 1 John 2, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. So uh, how I understand propitiation, it's kind of like a satisfaction of wrath. right? So he's a propitiation. I always thought it meant payment. I guess in one sense it is, but I think if you look up the definition of propitiation, it's like it's somebody that appeases wrath. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So I often tell people, well, Jesus obviously died for sins past, present, and future, because when he died, all our sins were in the future. We didn't even exist yet. So we didn't even exist, and yet Jesus died for our sins. You know, why would he die only for our sins in the past? Only for the sins we repented of. No, no, he dies for all sins because when he died on the cross, all the sins, past, present, and future, were laid on him and he paid for the sins of the whole world. 1 Timothy 4, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. All right, so it's worthy for you to receive this saying. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. So you can see that Jesus Christ is not only the saviour of believers, he's also the saviour of unbelievers. It just doesn't do them any good because they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can see that he has paid for their sins as well as, as the sins of believers. He has paid for the sins of the whole world. Even for the sins of reprobates. I believe he has paid for those sins as well. It's just that they are unable to believe. They're unable to receive that grace anymore. It's not that their sins were not paid for. These things command and teach. Well, I don't mind if I do. Hebrews 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So you see how Jesus pays for all sins. This, this, this issue of eternal security is intertwined in the gospel. You can't say you believe the gospel and yet do not believe in eternal security. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, look at this, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, I've just come to this passage. I'll just address this one since I'm here. But some people believe this is a passage that's teaching work salvation. No, what he's saying here is we're saved by the gospel, and he's saying, hey, if you rem when he says, if you keep in memory, he's saying, if you remember what I preached to you, right? It's not saying keep in memory, meaning that if one day you stop believing, you won't be saved, you know, you can lose salvation. He's saying here, I preached you the gospel, you're saved by the gospel, remember what I preached to you, unless, what does he mean here? Unless you have believed in vain, what does that mean here? What he's saying here, unless you believe the wrong thing. Why? Because when you read the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, it's people denying the fact that Jesus even rose again. And when he's talking about the gospel, he says, hey, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Now, what sins did he die for? When the Bible says he died for our sins, did he just die for our sins in the past? No, he died for our sins in the past, present, and future. That's why eternal security is intertwined into the gospel, that if Jesus Christ died for my sins, then he paid for all my sins, full remission, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So this is why he's saying to them, hey, remember what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, meaning you didn't actually believe this. Because what were they questioning? What were they doubting? What were they denying, some of them, that he had rose again? 
And that's why 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the fact that, hey, Jesus Christ will die. He did rise again, and that's why we're going to rise again. And if he didn't rise again, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. Right? So if somebody doesn't believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, that's another reason why they can't be saved. So it's not only that you have to believe that he died for all your sins, but you have to believe that he died, he was buried, and rose again the third day. So that's what it talks about. It's not that you actually believe... See, because what people make this mean is they say believed in vain, meaning you actually believe the right thing, like you actually believe this, and yet you're not saved for some other reason, whether it's works or whatever. So it's not that you're believing in vain because you actually believe the truth and it's not profiting you. No, it's that they're not believing the truth. That's why it's not profiting them. Right? They're believing the wrong thing. That's why he's saying, remember, keep in memory what I preached to you. Remember what I actually preached to you, which was this, that he died for our sins, and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day. So full remission. Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago, so all our sins are in the future. And, you know, you think, well, what if I commit this sin, or what if I commit that sin? Well, Jesus Christ has already paid for it. He paid for all the sins in the future. And you know what's amazing? That's what I'm saying. It exalts the love of God, because what's amazing about Jesus Christ dying on the cross and, you know, I often tell people this, is that, you know, you don't know what your future holds. You, know, you don't know what sins you're going to commit. You may commit a sin in your life and you just think, I cannot believe I did this. I cannot believe, you know, I cannot believe it's come to this. I cannot, I cannot believe, I can't believe I find myself in this situation. And, and you are disgusted or shocked at the sin that you are committing but you know what? When Jesus went to the cross, he already knew it. He already knew every sin that you were going to commit, every sin that you were surprised with. God wasn't surprised. That's why when people say, you know, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? It's not like God is shocked when things happen. He knows that it happens. And yet, he went to the cross anyway. What an amazing gift. You know, what an amazing God we serve, that he knew. You know, and that's why when... You know, when you fall into sin and you get back into your old ways and you remember eternal security, man, it just makes you love God even more when you realize how much God loves you and how much you don't deserve his love. Fifth reason is sinless regeneration. Sinless regeneration. And what do I mean by that? So we already had, went through four reasons. Right, the plain definition, it's not of works unchanging promise of God we have full remission of sin so there's not a sin well what sin could we even do to lose salvation it's all paid for you know even if we tried to sin away our salvation we couldn't because everything has already been paid grace will abound if we try and sin away salvation but God forbid that anyone would try and do that what is sinless regeneration what do I mean by that now some people understand this incorrectly by meaning you as a whole Christian can become sinlessly perfect Right? As if you don't sin anymore. No, the Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What I mean by sinless, generation, sinless regeneration is the creature that is born again. See, the wages of sin is death. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're born again, that new creature is unable to sin. And that's why you'll always have eternal life because that new creature will never earn the wages of sin which is death once you shed this sinful body john 3 marvel not that i said unto thee you must be born again so we read this in the scripture reading but the fact that we have to be born again so that creature that new creature spiritually that is born again is born of god it's born of the spirit and what we learn Oh, I guess uh, why, why I'm going to John 1 talk is obviously the way we are born of God is that we believe. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how we are born into God's family and we have that new man. Now, as we look into 1 John 3 and we look at the difference between the new man and the old man, we learn that that new man is sinless. That's what I mean by sinless regeneration. That new man that is regenerated, the Son of God, spiritually, that is attached to our soul, cannot sin. Whosoever is born of God 
doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So this is another reason why we have eternal security, why we are always safe, because there is no way that that new man can lose salvation. Not only if we sin, our sins are paid for in the flesh, but the new man doesn't even sin anymore. That's why this new man never goes to hell. And obviously we learned last week about that struggle. 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. So there's that being born again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we are raised, we are born again by the work of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And people prior to Jesus Christ were looking to his resurrection and those of us who are born again now are looking back to his resurrection. It was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but in these last days he was manifest for us. Now the reason why I am going to this passage is I just want to, because previously when I preached this, my fifth reason was always, you know, if you're a son, you're always a son. And that is true. But I want to just explain uh, the difference. Because you need to understand the difference between a begotten son of God and a created son of God. Right? Now, Adam was a created son of God. I believe angels were created sons of God too. I won't go into this, that, that um, portion in this sermon. But in Luke 3, we see here, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Right? Now, Adam was created as a son of God. He wasn't born a son of God. He was created. Why, why is he called a son of God? Because he was created in God's image. Now, we then are sons of Adam. Now, if, when Adam sinned, he died. Right? So Adam sinned in the flesh. He had to believe on Jesus Christ and be born again and be begotten, be, be a begotten son of God. But just because he was a created son of God, that didn't mean he went to heaven. That, that doesn't mean that he automatically went to heaven. So this is what I just I want to, this is just a t technical point of difference, but I just want you to get your head around this, is that, yes, we believe on Jesus Christ, Yes, we become sons of God. Yes, as sons, begotten sons of God, we go to heaven. But we need to distinguish between a created son of God and a begotten son of God. Because you don't go to heaven just because you are a son of God. You need to be a begotten son of God that does not sin in the, in the spirit to go to heaven. Because Adam was a created son of God. But if he did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he would have went to hell. So what you have to understand about this analogy about being a son of God, it's not that you go to heaven just because you're a son of God. You go to heaven because you're a begotten son of God. You're born again of the Spirit and you're sinless, right? Because if you're a created son of God and you sin, Adam would have went to hell, right? So I want you to see that difference, right? So it's, you don't just go to heaven only because you're a son of God. You need to be born again of the spirit and have the new creature that full remission that sinless creature in order to go to heaven now where this son and father relationship does work it's in the analogy in understanding eternal security right so it's not that you just you you go to heaven because you're a son of god you go to heaven because you're a begotten son of god not a created son of god but the reason why we use the analogy of being born again to explain eternal security because once you are a son of somebody, you are always a son of somebody, right? That's where it links in and ties into eternal security is that once I am somebody's son, that relationship exists no matter what I do, right? No matter if I sin or if I stop believing, even if my children come to me and say, you know what, Dad, I don't even believe you're my dad anymore. Does that change the fact that they're my child? No. So you see how eternal security, or well, the, the relationship of father and son, it's analogous to eternal security, but it's not the reason for eternal security. The reason for eternal security is because we're born again and we are a begotten son of God as opposed to Adam who was a created son of God. He didn't just go to heaven just because he was a type of son of God. He, he went to heaven because he had to believe on Jesus Christ. But when you think of the analogy of, hey, I'm trying to explain to somebody why once I'm born, I'm always, I'm always saved is because once I'm a son, I'm always a son. 
but Jesus says we will never die and we never die because we never sin. So they're all kind of interlinked. But I hope I'm making myself clear is that Adam, because he was created, he sinned and he could have died in that state if he did not believe on Jesus Christ. Now, I do, I do believe he did believe. And I believe he did, that Adam and Eve did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that's why they were saved. He wasn't just saved because he was created son of God. Now, let's end this sermon just on Romans 8. Romans 8, where if you really reflect on once saved, always saved, like I said, it really exalts the love of God. And that's what we read about in Romans 8. So we're just going to finish this sermon here in Romans 8. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So you see, if God is the one that gives you salvation, and God is for you, he's going, to be the one, he's going to have to be the one that takes away salvation. Now, why would he give salvation knowing every sin you're going to commit? What reason would he have to take it away? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? So the elect are those people that believe on Jesus Christ. It is God that justifies. You see that, see, nobody can, lay anything to the, to, nobody can lay anything to the charge of God's elect. Why? Because God is for us. So because God is for us, God justifies us. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's why, that's what Romans 8 is teaching. For if he that condemned, who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. So who is able to condemn us besides God himself? But it was God the one that is for us. It's God the one, God's the one that justified us. God's the one who died for us. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And now he goes through a list of possibilities. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? So this is the persecution that is coming on them. Saying, hey, who is able to take away the love of Christ from us if God is the one that justifies? If God is for us, God's the one that died for us. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, so now he gives a list of other reasons, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, look at this, nor things present, now look at this, nor things to come. So you see how we have eternal security? Because there's nothing to come that's going to separate us from the love of Christ, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, I don't know how to make it any clearer than that, where Paul just goes through every reason. He's just like, if God is for us, if God is the one that saved us, why would God unsave us knowing when he, when he knew us fully? He knew us completely. He knows our beginning from the end and he gave us salvation if we believe on Jesus Christ. It would have to be him that takes it away. But what are we going to do that would make him take it away? That's why the Bible says here that there's nothing. Tribulation, distress, principalities, powers, nor things present. There's nothing that will happen now nor nothing that will happen in the future that will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As long as we believe, right? As long as we have put our faith on Jesus Christ, we have received eternal life. Once you are saved, obviously you have to get saved first. But once you are saved, you're always saved. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the promises that you've given us to all that believe on you. And Lord, this is not a process of having to just keep on believing until we die. This is if we believe and receive through faith. One time we have everlasting life. 
present tense, and we have your unchanging promise, this immutab the immutability of your counsel, your oath, and the fact that you cannot lie. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this assurance that we can truly say that we know we have eternal life and experience the love of God in the present, not just hope we will deserve it in the future. So we thank you, Lord, that we don't earn our salvation, and we thank you that we cannot be bad enough to lose salvation. And thank you for loving us so much, Lord. You know, as we reflect on our life, we re reflect on our sins. Lord, you paid for it all. You knew it all when you went to the cross. And uh, Lord, thank you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.